Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. So there's a, a part in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 2, where he says, um, what, what kind of thing is virtue? And he lays out three different possibilities. Um, I actually didn't write one of them up here yet, but what that possibility is is a habit or a disposition. And he says, um, are virtues capacities? Are they potential that we have? You know, what does he mean by that? Well, you know, we have the potential for feeling all sorts of things. And if, if you don't have that, then there's something lacking to your humanity. There's something damaged, right? If all you could feel was fear, anger, and um, desire, then you would be basically at the level of a snake. You would be lacking something that mammals have, uh, the capacity to feel genuine affection that um, you know, we kind of take for granted. But you know, our brain develops in, in different ways, and some people's brains don't develop all. Um, and there could be some, certain things in, in one's upbringing or environment that you know push that out of oneself as well. But we all have these capacities based on our human nature. And Aristotle says, well, by nature, we're neither good nor bad. So we don't start out automatically good. We don't start out automatically bad. Some theories of human nature do see human beings that way, don't they? Um, but Aristotle doesn't. He says, we're not a completely blank slate, but we have these capacities, and then a lot of it depends on what we do with them. Those are mere potential. So we also have capacities for acting in certain ways. You know, um, you know, if we think if we think about anger, for example, I have the capacity to hit people. I have the capacity to yell at people. I also have the capacity to go off and you know take ten deep breaths and compose myself. Um, those are all possibilities for me. Um, those are all things that are part of human nature. You know, they're all things that you can teach a child, for example. Um, what about emotions? Could virtues be emotions? You know, for instance, let's think about good emotions. What are some some emotions that we typically see as as good? Yeah. Happiness. Okay, yeah, being in a happy, joyful state, um, you know, sort of the opposite of a person who's a downer, right? Yeah. Love. Love, right, yeah, that's, that's a real big one. Aristotle actually doesn't talk that much about that, but he, he is interested in, in affection uh, and friendship. Um, any others that are particularly, I mean, yeah, happiness or joy and, and love, yeah. Being relieved, that, that's usually because something bad didn't happen. So it's not completely positive, but that could work too. Now, when you think about the way people tell other people to be, just be happy. You know, be a nice person to be around. Um, be loving. Well, those would be, from Aristotle's perspective, emotions. And those themselves are not they're positive or negative in the way that we feel them, but they're not morally positive or negative. It's not like a person who is loving is therefore, because of the mere fact that they love, a good person in Aristotle's book. Because they could love the wrong things, or they could love the wrong way, or love the wrong people. Um, there might actually be some people that you should hate from Aristotle's perspective. Um, there probably are some times when you shouldn't be happy. You know, if you observe a whole crate full of kittens um, drowning, you know, in the river, you probably should be upset. 
if you're if you're like, wow, this is this is great. There's probably something that you want to look at, you know. Um, so it, it's not the emotions by themselves that are necessarily good or bad. Actions are a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a moment. So Aristotle says, well, what is really good or bad? It's our habits. It's our dispositions. It's the way in which we characteristically, over time, because that's part of who we are, the way in which we process and act on our emotions. Also, to some extent, the things that we al allow or um, you know, seek out to cause our emotions. You know, so he's not saying that anger, you know, anger by itself is neither good or bad. I mean, if you get angry all the time uh, over really simple stuff, that's part of a disposition, but it has to do with how you feel it, what provokes the anger. So the anger becomes bad because of the disposition that shapes it, that feeds it, that, that directs it, that orders um, goods. And these things have to be developed over time. We have some degree of control over that, but not, you know, not the sort of control where we can just snap our fingers and now I'm no longer a, an angry person. Now I'm a generous person. You have to actually work on it over time. So what about actions now? Well, Aristotle says if you want to evaluate actions, you can call actions good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust. Um, but if you want to call them good in the fullest sense, then you have, you're going to have to make reference to these dispositions. Virtues are good dispositions, the kind of things that make us fully what we are, they make us more rational, they allow us to proceed towards happiness or flourishing, to be good in our own lives, in other people's lives. Um, they allow us to do what we ought to do well, to, to, to be in a good state. Um, there are certain kinds of actions that are characteristic of that. We'll talk a little bit more about the specifics in, in a few minutes. Um, likewise, there, on the bad side, there's going to be some things that are characteristic of that as well. So, hitting another person. Um, that could be a good or bad action, really, depending on what the point behind it is. If you're on the battlefield and you're defending your city and your job is actually to go out there and hit other people with pointed stuff that's going to kill them, um, and you do hit another person, that's actually a good act. And if you had to do that while standing up to your fear that that other guy is trying to run you through at the same time and you stayed in your place, you're actually um, doing an action that at least is in accordance with courage. It might actually come from a full disposition of courage. If uh, you refuse to hit the other person, even though your city is depending on you to fight for it and nobody else is going to do it and bad things are going to happen to all the people that you love because you're, you're not willing to hit somebody, um, that would be a bad action. That's coming from Aristotle would say, if you want to understand why that's a bad action, call it a cowardly action. Um, if you hit somebody, now let's say we take the soldier out of the picture, right? You're just walking on the street, you walk up to somebody and you just pop them in the face. And somebody says, why did you do that? And he said, it was like hitting people. I get a kick out of it. Well, Aristotle would say there's something really wrong with you and that that action is made worse by the fact that that's part of your character. Um, it's a bad action to begin with, to hit somebody with no provocation. But to go up to people deliberately and just you know, hit them and, and do that day after day after day, that's a sign of really bad character. Um, that makes the action worse. Um, I'm trying to think of cases where it could be different. Well, you, you, get the, you get the general idea, right? We evaluate actions from a virtue ethics perspective, not just as the actions, but as parts of a larger picture of a person's character. And, and we could, could we be wrong about a person's character? Can we misjudge it sometimes if we don't have full information? Yeah. But if you observe people long enough and you've got enough common sense, you, know, you can tell who are good and bad people in this sense by seeing who actually is generous and who's stingy, who actually uh, is a good friend and who's a bad friend, who betrays their friends, um, who uh, 
um, arranges their life in such a way as to make it convenient for them and them alone, and who actually takes other people <laughs> into consideration, right? But that's not one that Aristotle talks much about, but you can understand that as a virtue as well. So what's really going to matter is th this level of habitual disposition, what we do. Is that all that you need for a thing to be a virtue? No, there's a bit more than that. But virtues are very much like other things that we learn over time. Like any of you who've ever played um, on, a, on a sports team and had to do some drills, um, you know, maybe in high school or middle school, or some of you are athletes now, or any of you who are musicians, uh, what are other things like this? Any, any on-the-job training that you've had, you've had to develop it over time, and eventually it became part of who you are. It became, as Aristotle says, second nature, right? Well, virtue works like that as well. Um, what else is needed in order for an action to be virtuous, in order for an action to be fully good? Aristotle says, well, you have to be acting out of virtue. Um, you also have to know what you're doing. So, you know, can you do bad things um, because you didn't know the whole situation that you're in and you try to do a good thing and it may actually have even come from your good character? Yeah, uh, that doesn't make you a bad person. Um, likewise, are there bad people who do good things occasionally without realizing that they're doing a good thing to somebody else? Sure, happens all the time. Doesn't mean they're good people because of that. You actually have to know what it is that you're doing. You have to be aware of the situation that you're in. And you have to um, choose the action or the emotional response that you have for its own sake, because it's the right thing. Um, can you do all sorts of things that are good actions? for reasons that don't have that much to do with that action. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could pay me to tutor you in all sorts of subjects, because I, you know, I actually have tutored a lot of different subjects. Um, is that the same thing as my volunteering, you know, because I care about you as a person to help you out with your quest for knowledge? No, I'm just getting paid, right? You wouldn't call the action that I'm engaging in necessarily a good action if I'm just doing it to get paid. What if I, you know, think about, you know, the proverbial Boy Scout helping the old lady cross the street. If he's only doing it to get the merit badge, or whatever it is that Boy Scouts get, I might be mixing it up. Um, I know Girl Scouts get badges, right? But they do? No, I'm on track. Um, if he's just doing it for the merit badge, is he doing a good act? It's a good act insofar as it keeps the lady from getting Hit. But it's not a good act in the sense of coming from good character, yeah. But if you said that virtues have to be done out of habit, then yeah. wouldn't like his action it's sort of like teaching him what he's supposed to be doing? Yes. And this is one thing that's a very good question. This is one thing that Aristotle doesn't make clear enough. Sometimes when we do that sort of thing, when we have an extrinsic reward for, or, or avoiding a punishment for doing a certain kind of action that would be a virtuous action. Um, the person, it doesn't seem to catch on. And, and you quit rewarding them, they quit doing it. So it didn't become part of their character. Um, yet, at the same time, the kind of training that we have to do with kids has to start with, like, giving them some candy or some praise or, you know, not um, punishing them for doing something good and then you know taking something away and punishing them for doing something bad. What determines that that sort of catch, you know, whether it's going to go off in the direction of virtue or just stay at the same level? He doesn't talk very well about that. That that is one sort of gap in his his treatment unfortunately. Yeah. But like um, continuing what you're saying, if you're teaching a child and like you take something away and something like that. Like, isn't that what he was talking about, justice, where it's like if you hurt them, it's like continuing something where, like, they learn that oh. justice to them, you know, so like, is it really, 
Yeah, if, if they never understand what you're doing to be anything other than imposing force on them, right. um, then they're not gonna, they're not going to progress. Yeah, and Aristotle. Um, this is kind of a side note, but Aristotle seems to be kind of of two minds about this. If you think about just his theory in general, he's presuming that by our human nature, we do have the capacity to to get it, to see eventually that oh, there's a point to this besides just punishing me. Um, in practice, if you look at the remarks that he says about ordinary people and about the way politics works and stuff like that, he seems to be very pessimistic about this actually happening for most people. He thinks that, that the, the majority of people are actually, and this, he's talking about Greeks at his time, are actually um, fairly untrustworthy, not virtuous, given to, you know, being very selfish, and the only way you're really going to keep them in line is by making sure to, to punish them when they do the wrong thing, or at least you know have the laws in place. Um, he he does say some things that kind of tie this together. It, it really helps, according to Aristotle, to have the right upbringing. Um, but again, this is this is one weak area of, of Aristotle's uh, theory. If he were around today and he had the chance to, like, you know, talk on his own behalf, I think there were, there were some things that he could say that would make sense out of that. But we don't we don't have those. And I'm not Aristotle, so I'm not going to try to come up with them. Um, what else? Is this all that's needed? Aristotle also says that you have to have some sort of criteria, some sort of way of, of figuring these, these things out. And what is that going to look like? He says that a virtuous action will be one that is done um, in accordance with um, reason. So it's going to use our rationality. It's going, and it's going to be, have to do with a particular case. It's going to have to figure out sort of specifically what's appropriate in this case. So reason, um, or another way of thinking this is, is in terms of models. You know, you can model yourself after a person who is virtuous. So, if you want to develop a better temper, look at people who, even though they do get angry, keep their anger under control. And only seem to get angry at the right time or give, give way to their anger at the right time. And then, you know, if you want to actually become like them, look at what they do, look at the way that they live, and then you do the same thing, you emulate them to try to become like them. And eventually, reason in you is going to work much better and you're going to be able to figure it out on your own. Um, but it may take some guidance at first. Same thing if you want to become temperate. Let's take that as an example, because that's, I think, one that's very easy to relate to. What does temperance or moderation have to do with? Bodily uh, desires. And what are the big bodily desires? Food, drink, sex, I guess sleep too, um, a few other comfort, things like that. Let's just take food though. If you got yourself into a bad disposition with respect to food, where you eat whatever you want, whenever you want, because you know that's your right and that's the right thing to do, in this society, you're going to get fat pretty quick. Right? Because they put so many things out there for you, that if you don't have any restraints on your appetite, uh, you know. I mean, you've all seen all these these like fast food nation and stuff like that. They will give you as much food as you can eat, and it's up to you to actually like to you know, be able to say, "Nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on it." Or if you're gonna eat as much as you want, then you have to exercise, right? You can't not exercise, you can't eat as much as you want. Um, what if you want to change that? Is that an easy thing to change? That's tough. Any of you who've been on diets, you know how, how you know, diets, they're no fun, right? Uh, you're restraining yourself. Um, is it easier when you've got somebody to look up to? Somebody who's been through it? Somebody who can say, yeah, I, I know what that felt like, um, but here's what you got to do. What do you think? 
Some of you can probably say that from experience, not necessarily with that, but with, with other things as well. Eventually, you're able to say to yourself, this is the right amount for me. This is what I should have at this time. And eventually, according to Aristotle, you'll actually come to desire that. That will become what feels right to you. That, then you, you can tell your virtues with respect to that least food. Um, so that's the, the general idea of virtue.